Star Trek Nemesis is the final nail in the proverbial space coffin. No, wait, it is a space coffin. And I'm not just speaking metaphorically here, because this whole movie reminds me of death. But who am I kidding, what doesn't these days? At what point did the Star Trek franchise go horribly wrong? Now I ain't saying no one in particular is to blame. But what happened? When did Star Trek go from being a fun space adventure the whole family could enjoy, to violent, dark, depressing horror movies? Kill everything on that ship. Now I ain't saying all Star Trek didn't have its dark elements prior to this. But it was always done with a little bit of class. And it never really affected the whole overall movie. I don't think I've ever seen a movie like this, with mind rape, child slave labor, guy getting imperiled on a spike and then pulling it through his own guts, horrific scenes of death, close-ups of Marina Sirtis, disturbing diseases, people getting sucked out into space. After the movie, I felt like going out coffin shopping. Do you remember All Good Things, the final TNG episode? What a fun, adventurous way to end such a great TV show. We see all the characters in different time periods, go back to the beginnings, see what happened to everybody. It was just great. All Nemesis did was want to make me stop taking my heart medicine. So let's get started talking about this movie. Number one. Star Trek X, The Wrath of Shinzon. So you have to be a total asshole not to see the obvious parallels between Nemesis and the Wrath of Khan. And I'm not mentioning this to say like they ripped off that plot or anything, but what they did do was rip off that plot. All it really did was shine a giant spotlight on how Nemesis failed to reach that level of quality. I got a feeling that a conversation like this took place. Hey, we should make another Star Trek The Next Generation film before they get too old, one of them dies, or people stop caring. Right. Right. What should we do next? Well, we slapped together the first one and it sucked. Let's not do that again. People like the Borg one, right? That was dark and violent. But then we slapped together the next one and no one liked that. So we should make another dark and violent one. That's right. Yeah. We can get the best guys to work on it. Two people no one ever heard of. Hey, maybe we could rip off, I, I mean, pay homage to the Wrath of Khan. Because that was a popular one. We'll make it about Picard and Data. Again, let's not take any risks. Hey, remember when they took a risk on a weird plot about humpback whales and traveling back in time? Wow, that was a disaster. <laughs> So let's make yet another movie about revenge and a doomsday device and violent space explosions, cause that'll be a safe bet. So let's do an analysis. So we have two homosexual villains who both spent a long period of time in an undesirable place. Eventually they both get their own ship, a loyal crew, and the ability to escape and continue on with their lives. However, they both give in to their own crazy revenge. They mess around with the captains of the Enterprise and fuck themselves over in the most horrible way. Eventually everyone ends up in a space battle in a nebula where communication is disrupted as is their ability to accurately shoot at each other. Then the second most important character in Star Trek sacrifices himself so that a doomsday device doesn't kill the crew of the Enterprise. There's even a scene where both captains talk to the bad guy as a distraction while they secretly prepare an alternate attack. Open a channel. It's on screen. I hope you're still alive, Jean-Luc. Oh yes, I am. Khan, how do we know you'll keep your word? Shinzon, I don't think I ever told you about my first Academy evaluation. 
soon. Lock the phasers on target and await my command. Phasers lock. Fire gauge. The thing was, overall Rathacom was a smarter movie. It was about Kirk dealing with changes in life, realizing he was getting older. It was also about Kirk never having had to face the no-win scenario. For Kirk, everything usually worked out in the end, but not this time. This time Spock died. You see, Kirk grew as a character. Emesis lacked all these elements, except for people dying. All that happens really is Picard just discovers that if he grew up in a space mine, he just turned into a violent psychopath that pulls a spike through his own guts. Gee, how uplifting. Picard then just storms off the bridge at the end and everyone is left standing around with this look on their faces like, this Star Trek shit's getting too violent for me. Nemesis just basically leaves you with this sick, tired, depressed feeling at the end. But couldn't they have ended it the way the show ended? The nice game of Pinochle? Something like where you don't feel like slitting your wife's wrists? Oh, and unrelated news, Bambri killed herself in the bathtub after I found out she was taking money out of my wallet. I guess she felt guilty about it. Number two, wedding bells. Nemesis opens at Riker and Troy's funeral. I mean wedding. Wedding. By the way, which is mysteriously lacking, the walks on a Troy, whose only mission in life was to see her daughter get married. Now, Majel might have been sickly at that point from her leukemia. So I'll give that a pass, but I really think the writers just forgot. Mother, why don't you leave her alone? If it weren't for you, she'd be married by now. But anyways, a lot of people like to complain about two characters who are in this scene, Worf and Wesley. Are you alright? Romulan ale should be illegal. It is. A glass of Romulan ale, Doctor? Thank you, Senator. The trading embargo has been officially lifted, if you were wondering. Now last time we saw a little Wesley, he had quit Starfleet and gone around the universe with some weird guy. Commander, how would you feel about being named Federation Ambassador to Kronos? And Worf had been on Deep Space Nine, and then at the end he got made a Klingon Ambassador. Now they are suddenly back in uniform and at the wedding. Eh, this doesn't really annoy me. It's entirely possible that Wesley got bored with the Traveler and came to his senses. Maybe went back to Starfleet. Same with Worf. Maybe Worf was an ambassador for a year and then got bored. You see, each movie the reason for Worf being there gets less and less important. First he's on the Defiant and is beamed over in battle. Then he's, um, was at a conference or something? Now he's just there and don't ask why. If they don't care, I'm not gonna care. In fact, it seems like no one cares about the accuracy of these characters no more. Michael Dorn put on 50 pounds since we last saw him. Picard is happy and smiling and completely out of character, and Marina Sirtez apparently totally forgot how to play Counselor Troy. Troy now sounds almost exactly like Marina Sirtez sounds in interviews. Whether you're a real bride or a make-believe bride, you're the princess for the day. It's tradition, Worf. You of all people should appreciate that. I'm not certain of that now, Captain. I do sense something unusual. I'm proud of the work that we all did. I'm not certain of that now, Captain. Well, you're in quite a mood today. My father was a Starfleet officer. Ah, enough about this crap. Back to the wedding scene. Now I'll tell you what really bothers me. It's them green plastic drum symbols. Why do they have to have space symbols? Is it to remind us that we're in the future? Look, the symbol goes back to prehistoric times, and you're asking me to believe that all the way from then up until the last couple of years, they started making drum symbols in transparent green plastic? And if any f is post a comment saying it's supposed to be some kind of semi-transparent green metal alloy that reverberates sound much better than traditional symbols, well then you ain't getting sent a pizza roll, you got it? Because we've consistently seen Star Trek characters playing traditional wood, wind, and stringed instruments all throughout Star Trek. Riker even played a fucking trumpet. None of these instruments have been turned into a transparent green plastic. Listen, enough about the symbols. My grandkids need their ear medicine. If you want to help, please mail cash only to Trump Taj Mahal Casino Hotel. Care of Harry S. Plinkett. Slingo Mystery Bonus Slot Machine near the men's bathroom, Atlantic City, New Jersey, 08401. Number 3. 
I don't know what's happening in the movie. Again, C-grade hack writers and producers were put in charge of a Star Trek movie. That's where I would want you to look. And it's amazing. To write a story that looks like it's a complex mystery plot, but when you break it down, nothing makes sense. I guess we're supposed to forget about the details of what just happened in the movie by the time we get to the drool-inducing action scenes. Don't ask questions. Just keep shoving popcorn in your faces and shelling out money. I'm gonna ask questions, goddammit. So the real story begins when Worf's thing beeps and they scan the positronic signature in the Colaris region. Captain, I am picking up an unusual electromagnetic signature from the Kalaran system. Which is of course B4 was on a planet and it's been placed there by Shinzon as a way to bait Picard. The bait you couldn't refuse. First of all, it's never explained how Shinzon found a rare Noonien Sung android. Was it on Romulus? Did he find it in space? Was it just a coincidence that he found it and it was the same as Data who just happens to be Picard's second officer? Hmm, that's awfully convenient. Also, how did he get it to emit the positronic signature specifically at the Enterprise? Because if the Enterprise's computers detected it, you'd think other starships in the area would have too. There would be probably like 20 ships all arriving at Kolaris 4. They'd all be like, Are you guys here to check out the positronic reading too? How weird! So are we! Don't forget about us too! Hey everyone, let's meet down on the planet. Bring your doom buggies and beer. Number 4. B4. You sunk my starship. So everything Shinzon does to set up his master plan makes no sense. He wanted Picard to take B4 home with him. He also wanted Picard himself. I guess for the blood transfusion, although I never did seem interested in doing it. It is time for the procedure. We must begin the procedure now. So why did his initial plan put both of those things in jeopardy? First of all, why is B4 scattered about in pieces? The only reason I can think of is to have Picard and his friends find each piece one at a time in order to make it look like this is some kind of complex mystery plot when it isn't. I guess maybe Shinzon found them in pieces and didn't know how to assemble them. But why scatter them all over the place then? Why not just leave them in a pile? Let's think about this for a moment. What happened last time they found an android in pieces and assembled it? Are you prepared for the kind of death you've earned, little man? Oh god, right. Back off, or I'll turn your little man into a torch. The only person turning my little man into a torch is my urologist. <laughs> so Shinzon apparently wanted them to assemble B4 so that B4 could gather tactical information on Starfleet and lure Picard. So how did Shinzon know they wouldn't just dump the android parts into a storage bin and deal with it later? Or send it to a starbase for them to assemble and research? You'd think a guy who could build a massive ship with a perfect cloak could assemble a plastic android. That fat guy with the beard did it, so why couldn't he? That would have been a little smarter to ensure that B4 did what he was supposed to do. So we've established that Shinzon wanted Picard to find the android. So why did he make it so hard and dangerous to find? Or it was placed on a planet with dangerous ion storms or something that prevented them from using their transporters. I wouldn't recommend using the transporter. That ion storm doesn't look very neighborly. Okay. It was also put on a planet right near a bunch of aliens with machine guns that shoot at everything. But were those Remans disguised as primitive aliens with machine guns and tanks? To make it look like primitive aliens and machine guns and tanks were shooting at them? If so, why? It's really hard to tell because them aliens kind of look like Remans, but I'm not sure. I don't think they were. If they weren't Remans, then why did they put B4 on that planet right by the aliens with machine guns? That could have killed Picard. Either thing makes no sense. I think the whole scene was there so they could just have an action chase in a jeep. Really? That's it? Did a fucking kindergartner write this movie? Number 5. Picard, the Argo, and a big fuck you to the audience. It was the first great gift that John Logan gave me when Data and Worf and Picard go down to the alien world. Picard goes along and we are given um, a futuristic 
all-terrain vehicle to drive. It's mentioned in the behind the scenes that Brent Spiner's friend John Logan wrote the script, hence the excessive Brent Spiner screen time. And frankly, I'm enough of a Brent Spiner fan that I like seeing him play more than one person. It's also mentioned that Patrick Stewart likes cars and driving and off-roading in real life. And he'd be more happy with the script if he had a scene where he could drive a dune buggy. I've always enjoyed driving. I really, really enjoy driving and it's something I think about and I try to remain focused on it all the time. Rick Berman doesn't care about the Star Trek legacy anymore. And he seems like some kind of idiot, so he didn't object. So the result is the dumbest sequence in Star Trek history. A dune buggy chase. Really? No, really, this is real. This was actually filmed and put in a Star Trek movie. Yes, the enlightened Captain Picard, who loves playing flutes, drinking tea, and reading Shakespeare, also loves redneck off-roading. Can anything be more out of character? So you're telling me that the Enterprise has a support craft in which almost the entire space inside it is devoted to housing a vehicle that's less useful than the craft that houses it. A shuttlecraft can fly around, it can hover, land anywhere, fly up into the air to escape, say, other dune buggies. So what can the Argo do? Hold only three crew members. Provide no protection from the elements of alien worlds. Provide no real storage capacity. Is unable to get around mountains, rivers, or other natural barriers. Has only one compartment in the back that houses a giant laser cannon. Only useful if you happen to get in a chase scene with other land-based vehicles. Jesus, this thing reminds me of a He-Man toy or something. Now after doing some research, I found out that Argo is the trademark brand that makes ATVs. I assume they're responsible for the design or the creation of this thing, but I'm not really sure. That or it was named after the mythical ship Argo, but that was a ship. This is a dune buggy. I don't know, nor do I really care. What I do know is that the only thing spinning faster than those tires is Gene Roddenberry in his grave. Number 6. Picard loses a bet. Apparently, in his academy days, Picard had lost a bet. Then, although he was used to having a great head of hair that the ladies loved, he agreed to take a smiling picture of himself shortly after he lost the bet and shaved his head. After careful analysis of this movie by a team from the Hair Club for Men, we have come up with one of two possible explanations of the picture. That Picard lost a bet, or the filmmakers think the audience is stupid. I'm going with the latter. I have a feeling a conversation like this happened. So Picard's clone is just like him then? No, that's been done too much. So he's younger then? Yeah. But he's got to be bald, because if he's not bald, then the audience, even if we tell them, still won't understand that he's Picard's clone, because Picard is the bald captain. If he's not bald, then no one will understand what's happening. Okay, okay, he's bald. So I'm willing to accept the fact that Shinzon probably shaved his head to look more like the Remans. But why does young Picard have a shaved head? We all remember what Picard looked like when he was a cadet. He wasn't always bald. Remember that time when Picard's DNA got reverted and he ended up like a child? He had hair. Even the young clone Picard had hair. Additionally, when Dr. Crusher has a flashback to some time in the past when Picard was a little younger, we see the last remnants of his hairline. And while these examples are technically a Q recreation, a DNA transporter accident, and a nightmare brought on by a telepath, I still present them as evidence that Picard had male pattern baldness. That and he has a clear crown line on the back of his head. So then why does this photo show a cadet Picard that looks exactly like Shinzon? The answer is, they, they think, think the, the audience, audience is stupid. stupid. If this photo had looked like this, a picture of a young Picard as a cadet with hair, I guess we're all supposed to scratch our thick monkey craniums and ask, why is Picard staring at a picture of some guy? Even though the following dialogue with Dr. Crusher explains what the photo is, if the cadet didn't look exactly like Shinzon, we'd all be confused. Really? We're not that dumb. You know, this is kind of like if they made a film or, or even had a scene in a film that featured Abraham Lincoln as a boy, they'd have him wearing a stovepipe hat and a fake beard. That's how dumb the filmmakers think we are. Enough about that. Listen, I'm almost certain I'm gonna hit it big on this slot machine. I just need a couple thousand more bucks. I promise I'm gonna pay it back when I win. Please send cash on me too. Trump Taj Mahal Casino Hotel. 
care of. Number seven. Lights. Camera. Action. I think I've already established why the TNG movies totally suck. It's because of comments like this. I think the audience wants Star Trek to be an action movie. Wrong. Wrong, you asshole. Wrong. What we want is a good story, some good dialogue, and the characters that were on the show. Not one-dimensional action movie recreations of them. When producers and actors start meddling with the movie and develop the story, it always comes out like a big Lincoln log. Action is great, but pointless action is boring. That needs to be balanced out with a good story. B4 got more brains than this story. Why does the tall man have a furry face? Now I'll admit, Nemesis is a good action movie. But what is action? Let's discuss. I'd like to reference a next-gen episode called Power Play. I like this one. In this episode, aliens possess Troy, Data, and O'Brien. We were brought to this moon over five centuries ago from a star system called Uxmal. At first they pretend to be the ghosts of an old dead Starfleet crew, but we later learn that they're prisoners of some kind of weird alien penal colony. Why am I talking about this episode? Because it's a good example of action. Every action has a purpose which propels the story. They got a shuttlecraft accident, get knocked down by lightning, then they attempt to take over the ship, to take hostages, but they got a mission. The rest of the episode is kind of like a power struggle between them and Picard. The good guys, they think of a plan, they try some things, and then the stakes get higher when they fail. There's even a crying baby that's threatened. Eventually, we arrive at the exciting climax of the story, and the big action scene is... Get ready. It's people walking down a hallway. Yep, moving from 10 forward to the cargo bay is the centerpiece of the exciting ending. But to me, this is a hundred times more exciting than watching Riker pointlessly fight with a monster. In Power Play, I was interested to see what the conclusion was gonna be. What was the alien's final goal? How was Picard gonna outwit them? Did he have a trick up his sleeve? What was gonna happen to the hostages? These were things I cared about. People walking down a hallway ends up being more exhilarating than a needlessly long chase sequence with absolutely no tension or consequence. Or a pointless space battle. In the Raticon, each phaser hit was important and it changed the nature of the situation. In Nemesis, ships pointlessly fire at each other for 45 minutes. Proving the point that excessive action isn't necessarily effective action. Number 8. What's up with Shinzon? So the Romulans cloned Captain Picard so they could replace him in some kind of devious plot. So then they abandon the whole thing because it's too risky or something. But they send the little kid to work in a mine? They sent me there to die. Oh, they sent him there to die. Why didn't they just gas him? Or put him in a 1982 Cadillac DeVille and slam it into a tree at 85 miles an hour? Or slit his wrists in the bathtub? and then pay a prostitute to write a suicide note for you, and then push her down a well to make sure she don't tell nobody. Point is, Romulans are on the business of dirty business. Why are you doing this? Why keep him alive? Is a five-year-old really gonna help out in the mine? He's just gonna grow up and have his life conveniently form the background plot for a B-grade sci-fi action movie. On that note, the Remans and Shinzon were all slave labor, right? They say Remans were the lowest caste in Romulan society. The Remans themselves are considered an undesirable caste in the hierarchy of the Empire. Cannon fodder, basically. Cannon fodder. Hey, I just said that. So for one, how did Shinzon and them escape and have the time to build the Scimitar without having the Romulan Empire and the Tal Shiar find them? Furthermore, how does a kid who never went to school and a bunch of monsters that work in a mine have the resources or know-how to even build a massive ship like that with a perfect cloak? His cloak is perfect. From building the scimitar at a secret base. Oh, he built it on a secret base. Where? How? With who? I guess the Remans knew a lot about mining, so they probably could have dug up the materials, but that would have been a pretty massive operation. 
would have attracted a lot of attention. Then you'd need things like torpedoes, some antimatter, chairs, view screens. You'd think even before they laid down the first bulkhead, they'd be surrounded by a fleet of Romulan warbirds. So then for no reason, Shinzon wants to take over as the leader of Romulans, which at first he attempts to do politically. Then when that fails, he does it by force. So now he's in charge of Romulus, and all they want him to do is to start a war with the Federation, even though they just got done with the costly war with the Dominion. But was Shinzon's goal just to exterminate the population of Earth? If so, then he already had the capacity to do that without the Romulans' help. You're doing this to liberate the Remans. That is the single thought behind everything I have done. He already freed the Remans. And in that dark place where there was nothing but myself, I found my Riemann brothers. They showed me the only true kindness I have ever known. Kill him. I guess the director was confused too. The Shinzon character can't be just a straight bad guy. He's not a bad guy. Deploy the weapon. Yes. <laughs> He's not planning to defeat Earth. I'll always be with you now. He's planning its annihilation. And that's the whole essence of... Kill everything on that ship. The... As I understand the stuff. Hey asshole, we don't know what's going on in the movie. When we know what a bad guy wants to accomplish without changing his mind every five minutes, I guess it creates some tension. Part 3 crap. Shinzon accomplished his goal of escaping the mine and freeing the Remans before the movie started. After that, it gets hazy. He didn't want to kill Picard. I was merely curious about him. But then later he does. My life is meaningless as long as you're still alive. He wanted to be the next Praetor, but he seemed irritated when he had to do the whole Praetor thing and talk to Romulans. If you wanted to be the leader of the Romulan Empire, you should expect some conference calls. He needed Picard for the blood transfusion to save his own life. But he never really seemed interested in doing it. I guess he was always planning to attack Earth, but why? Do not forget our mission, Shinzon. You'd think his beef would have been with the Romulans. Spend 18 hours every day under the lash of a Romulan guard and you'll soon understand patience. Shinzon had a passing interest in Troy because she had a vagina. And he probably never did it with a chick. Oh, uh, maybe he fucked a Riemann in the ass, but he really wanted a girl. Maybe Shinzon should have taken the scimitar over to Ryza for a little vacation before the movie started. I'm sure him and the Remans would have fit right in. They could have played some volleyball in the pool, had some drinks by the bar, and of course, picked up some ladies on spring break. Spring break! Number 9. Shinzon reminds me of Dr. Evil. From the moment I saw Shinzon, I knew something was wrong. He reminded me too much of Dr. Evil. I'm going to place him in an easily escapable situation involving an overly elaborate and exotic death. They were going to replace you with me. He was bald and had a big nose. And that is to have sharks with frickin' laser beams attached to their heads. He wore an evil costume with shoulder pads. He was the head of an evil organization. And he even had a scar on his face. And then, of course, he sounded a lot like him. I want you to meet Daddy's nemesis. A lifetime of violence will do that. They were going to replace you. Mini with me. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my moon base. You've all been chosen to be part of my elite moon unit. Dr. Evil, while you were frozen, we began a program to clone you. Cool. Send in the clone! Huh? He is exactly like you in every way. Really? Ouch, baby. Number 10. 
other things happen, I guess. There's no foreseeable danger. So there's this weird planet near the Romulan border, which has suspicious positronic signatures on it, dangerous ion storms, and an undeveloped culture of monsters with tanks and machine guns. There's no foreseeable danger. This really looks like a trap to me, sir. So we see that Captain Janeway has been promoted to Admiral. Shouldn't she be in a prison? While well, I'm overriding those protocols. An alliance with the Borg? More like an exchange. We offer them a way to defeat their new enemy. We get safe passage through their space. You're forgetting the Temporal Prime Directive, Captain. The hell with it. Diplomacy, Captain? Your diplomacy destroyed my world. For the duration of this mission, the Prime Directive is rescinded. Your heart, your hands, your eyes are the same as mine. No, they're not. Picard is an artificial heart. Initiate the force beam. Excuse me, sir. I have a question. What's the point of that force field? Do you really think it's going to contain a warp core breach? How about you put that force field around the tubes with the flesh melting gas? Oh my god. Y you know, the first thing that's going to happen when we get hit is that force field's going to go offline. Oh, there it goes. So if the Remans built the scimitar, why didn't they design the buttons to be a little easier to press for large monster hands with huge fingernails? So Picard tries to activate the self-destruct, but it's offline. Auto-destruct is offline. Whew. Yep, I uh, guess we can't blow the ship up. Oh well. I won't tell anyone that you could have just fired a phaser at the warp core. Your secret is safe with me. I'm a coward too. So the Remans were bred for combat, eh? No one really taught them how to aim their weapons though, did they? So when monsters beam over to the Enterprise, Picard gives Riker the order to go ahead and stop them. Really? The first officer? Gee, don't they have a security force that can do that kind of work? Riker should be on the bridge in case he needs to take command in place of Picard. But I know where he went. Because the script needed something for Riker to do. And when a main character is set off to have a pointless fight with a monster to give him something to do, there are problems. So have another rewrite. So haven't we seen all this crap before? Just kind of like slightly different. Deploy the collector. Deploy the weapon. Sir, the manager you have the bridge, Commander. Try and you put some distance back. between you and the scimitar. One minute before separation, you'll see the cryogenic Ice. tanks vent. Weapons fire could ignite the exhaust. Intruder alert. So they're gonna team up with the fleet of starships to take on Shinzon. That's good, that makes sense. But instead of telling them, hey guys, we'll meet halfway, okay? Keep your eye out for us. Picard goes to them, and they plot a course through a giant green nebula that Data apparently knows will muffle their communications. Gee, what a great place for an ambush. Then the fleet just sits there. Hey, where's Picard? I don't know. We lost contact with them after they entered that giant green nebula. That Romulan broad figured out where they were. And she was in Romulus. She didn't even know where Picard was headed to either. She just found him in the green nebula. Alright, so let's get to the battle at the end. Even though I didn't read the script, I had a feeling that Picard was going to face off with Shinzon and something was going to blow up. 
At least they didn't say time's up. So let's talk about this ending. After shooting at each other for two hours, both ships are out of ammo. We have exhausted our complement of photon torpedoes. Disruptors are not functional, sir. Picard rams the Enterprise into Shinzon's ship, but that still doesn't stop him from turning on his death ring. They only have enough power to beam over one person, and of course Picard goes over for movie purposes. Let's think about this for one second. You know, part of the responsibility of being a commander in Starfleet means that sometimes you might have to order someone to their death. Picard really should have sent over Worf, given him a bat lift and some phasers and a knife, and said, Worf, kill everything you see and shut down that green thing before it kills everyone. You're not going to make it back, but you're going to save the ship and the Earth. See, Worf loves fighting monsters. And he would love to die in battle. To die defending one ship is the hope of every Klingon. Instead, a 65-year-old man with arthritis goes. Picard risks the safety of the Earth and his crew because it's... Data, this is something I have to do. Something he needs to do. Y'all remember when Picard got his ass handed to him by Malcolm McDonald, right? A little short elderly man kicked the shit out of him. So what, he's gonna go up against 26 Remans? That to me was a bonehead move as a commander. But this is an action movie, and the main character has to face off with the bad guy at the end. I might remind you though that in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, Kirk was never on screen with Khan. They never felt like they had to have Kirk beam over to the Reliant to fight with Khan, and then set the Reliant to auto-destruct. See, every movie doesn't have to be the same. So anyways, let's talk about what happened. Picard beams over, shoots people, they shoot back, Shinzon makes weird faces, they fight their way up to the green thing, they fall down, Picard loses his phaser, Data floats over, Shinzon gets impaled, he uses like a transporter thing to get Picard off the ship, then he blows himself up, and... <sighs> it's time for my chicken tenders. I'll be back. Mmm. Mm. All right. Absent friends. To absent friends. So what happened to all of our beloved characters? Well, Picard stayed on as captain. Data's dead, of course. Riker took command of the Titan and brought Troy with him. Then they both died in a transporter accident. <coughs> Beverly Crusher committed suicide. Worf became a spokesperson for Weight Watchers. Or wait, no, he became a Klingon governor. Geordi LaForge became an old man or something. Oh wait, that timeline didn't happen. No, Geordi LaForge became the captain of the USS Challenger. This is Captain LaForge of the Starship Challenger. And then, oh wait, no, that timeline didn't happen either. Wait, none of this happened. So email me if you want a pizza roll. Post a comment on this webpage if you want a pizza roll. <laughs>